Thank you, everyone. Welcome uh, to this event. We're hoping to have a lively discussion on sustainability and innovation. Um, we'll start off with talking about sustainability and energy efficiency at the core of innovation and how can GCC building design respond to climate change? I think if we start off with you. Yeah, thank you, Duncan. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and uh, thank you, colleagues, and Duncan, for having us in this uh, event. Uh, so, you know, sustainability is, is, is a big issue, obviously, and it's, it's a big subject with very broad parameters. Uh, sustainable design is not new. I mean, good design should be and is a sustainable design. It's been going on for millennia. Society has, um, you know, uh, endeavored to design uh, buildings and master plans and cities that respond to the climate and, and create sort of a haven for uh, society to be comfortable and flourish uh, and so on. Um, and the reality today has become a, a much more, uh, you know, sort of scientifically measured uh, subject, you know, with various sort of degrees of, uh, uh, you know, uh, grading and rating systems that allow us to understand sort of what sustainable measures we're doing. Um, but the reality is uh, that uh, for sustainable practices and for uh, architects and developers and contractors and government to adhere uh, to um, you know, these requirements, it needs to be, first of all, uh, legislation passed by government uh, and you know, government uh, boards that make sure this is enforced, and also to raise public awareness of it and, and, and for sort of people to understand the importance of this. Uh, you know, sustainable design practices and what it means for all of us and for our future generations. Uh, the other main uh, element of it is, is, is how to incentivize uh, groups and people and builders and architects and, and government and contractors, uh, you know, to make sure that, you know, it's not just, you know, sort of a piece of paper where we're saying we're doing sustainable design, it's actually, you know, practices that we uh, use in design, practices that we use in construction and then you know, future uh, sort of norms to make sure that we, you know, uh, maintain and, 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 and you know, uh, manage these uh, projects and developments in the right manner that it achieves this, uh, you know, end goal of a sustainable community. Okay, thank you. Uh, Karim, what's, what would you say your approach to sustainability with uh, given climate change? How are you responding? Look, I, th I think, I mean, I, obviously, I, I, I'm going to make some very valid points. I, th I think when we look at sustainability, uh, I'd like to discuss it in the context of innovation and how innovation ties in with sustainability. And I think that really starts at a macro scale. And I know that I think Neil will elucidate in much more detail than I can. But I think if we, we need to understand the context in which we're designing and how we're sort of rolling out the sustainability agenda and how technology can uh, align with that. So it's about the creation of places at a larger scale and then we step down into the technologies that then uh, get rolled out into individual buildings. So I think, you know, particularly in Saudi Arabia, we look at maybe more traditional technologies where thermal mass, uh, double skins, all these type of things are already uh, existing in traditional design and how that then equates into more uh, innovative solutions that are more representative of what we're trying to do today. Okay, interesting point. Dahlia, you, you have some opinions on artificial intelligence and how it can benefit designers to, to improve based on sustainability issues. Care to? Um, so, definitely artificial intelligence plays a vital role in what we do today. Um, basically, they need to look at data and how to analyze that and insert it into our buildings and then give trial and error, which takes time from the designers. But if it's done through AI, it eliminates half of the process. Then as designers, we pick what's the best solution to have sustainable buildings. Also part of what we do and part of sustainability is human-centric designs. So it would be interesting to see how AI could, in, could inform this human-centric design and actually insert some of the historical information and take this forward into something that would serve 
humanity and serve the purpose of what we do as designers. Interesting. Good. Yeah. Tarek? With the same AI or just sustainable? No, no, with, with, with the, the general subject of how are you responding to climate change? Maybe you're using AI, maybe other tools, other methodologies? I, I think the, uh, apart from talking about the innovation of sustainability and what's witnessing in the, in the current time and in the future, I think one of the most positive sh shift we started to notice in the region over the last few years is basically going back to the roots of sustainability. Mm how the region was operating 70 years ago, 100 years ago. So if you, if you look at the buildings and the forms and the design over the last maybe 10 years, there's a shift towards more under sensitivity and understanding of the building envelope and building skin and trying really to go back to the concept of, you know, the things we've studied at university, you know, cross ventilation, a proximity of buildings, <laughs> a thick skin, double skin, filtering, uh, if you look at the region in the last 20, 30 years, it's more about curtain walls, which was, you know, linked with the concept of modernism and, 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 and modern architecture. And I think in the last 10 years, even the briefs we received from the clients, there is a heavy kind of, you know, focus on going back to the basic measures mm -hmm. uh, that architects used to do here before all the kind of, you know, the cooling systems and the innovations. Yeah. And uh, so I think for me, that was a pivotal change in the way of thinking that, you know, People here, tens and ten years ago, used to have a, a perfect sustainability measures. Mm. And I think before going to very futuristic technological ways, there's now tendency towards really addressing. There's the a simpler way to do it. We don't have to go high tech. We can use high tech to help design, but we don't actually have to implement high tech in the, the actual uh, buildings and assets. Okay, cool. Neil, how, how would you say climate change is affecting your approach to master planning? Yeah, I think from the lens of urban design, I think the key is to get the fundamentals right. I think we already have the answers in many instances, you know, shading, green open spaces, um, kind of water in spaces as well. I think it's been done th throughout the past, so there's lessons what we can learn of how to be done in the past. I'm just getting back to the kind of the basics, I think, of how we create open space and how we create shaded space within our cities. I think then you can get down to the more kind of building level specifics of materiality. I think when you think about kind of the, the right to way in the public realm within our cities constitutes about 30-35%. A lot of this is dark materials which retains heat. So I think to create more comfortable, sustainable environments, change the materiality, more reflective materials which help reduce the temperature, ground plane, which makes it more comfortable for people to be outside. I think in New York they have an issue with the kind of the, the urban heat at the roof level. It, a lot of the roofs in New York kind of contain the heat so you get this kind of this almost kind of oven effect. So they have a strategy what they're putting in place now is to change all the materials of the roofs and that's having an effect at the ground plane. So there's lessons what we already know and implementing them and just making sure that we get back down to the core basics of what actually works. Yeah. Cool. I think uh, aligned with that is do you think societies can give up personal vehicles and move towards a transit oriented development? Do you think that's uh, likely or feasible or is it, is that it absolutely necessary? I, I think absolutely. I think the key challenge is, you know, is, is human behavior and how do we change that? And a lot of it comes down to um, kind of functionality, it comes down to the ease. I think the only way which you can get people to leave the car home is if the public transport is more convenient. Um, you know, kind of later we'll talk about kind of transport and safety development or communities. People don't like to walk further than five minutes to get to their destination or to get to their choice of transport. So when we create infrastructure, you know, there's a big talk about the 15 minute city and what this actually means. People are looking for convenience. I think I read an interesting fact that throughout your work in life, you'll spend 1.6 years in a car commuting to work, and that typically equates to stress. It, it, so I think if we can remove the stress out of people's lives and make happier cities, happier people, we have to create convenience and create an art network of you know, micro modes of mobility with larger scales of mobility and creating that, allowing those to kind of overlap with each other and making the journey part of the experience, not kind of the A to, the A to B. I think that will give people a choice and it'll make people more happier to leave the car at home and to kind of use more public modes of transport. Uh, Duncan, if I could just add to that. I think whilst I agree with all of what you say, I mean, TODs tend to work in areas with very high densities. And that's one of the reasons why they're successful. And I think 
you know, we see very good examples of that in Southeast Asia, particularly China, where it's really started. I think we need to be really mindful of the context in which we want, we're proposing these sorts of developments and how they fit within the cultural context of the locations that we're going to put them and how they serve as communities. So, yes, while I agree that the, the, the idea of the transitory development is very attractive uh, and very engaging and in a development context offers a lot of benefits, I think certainly within the GCC and, 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 and including Saudi Arabia, there needs to be uh, a shift towards uh, addressing how we use uh, our vehicles. And that's not going to be something that happens overnight. I mean, I think we need to think about the last mile solutions as well. Um, so we need to ensure that what we design and what we propose at, at the development planning stage rather than the development stage is fit for purpose in terms of its location. Uh, I think that's really critical. Yeah, mm. I think Dalia, we're both working on Dalia Gate, yeah. so I think that's a fully integrated so, plan. Yeah, so basically, um, I think that TODs are in general aligned with Vision 2030. So in Dara'iya, we are building community. And basically, our community is based on walkability. So we are encouraging walkability in Dara'iya. So we have allowed for bikes, we have allowed for motorcycling, small motorability that, that would allow for TODs, but also we have three metro stations that is planned already in the master plan. And this cannot happen if we don't have a holistic vision for the kingdom. And this is happening across projects in general, which is amazing. And if you ask people, would they be willing to change their mindset? I think in Saudi, we are very adaptable. You give us something and we adapt quickly. It's, it's amazing. And it's just, again, maybe with communities that were not developed from the start, I think solving the last mile, mm. as you were saying, Karim, would be a, a challenge. But I know that other entities, including the, the Ministry of Transportation, RCRC, they are all working together to find solutions for this last mile, for it to happen. So this is something, definitely, that we are open to. Good, that's a very positive response. I appreciate yeah. that. Tarek, do you think you have a...? Yeah, I think, the, again, going back to the back to the roots, and, and it's not only on sustainability, but also the social behavior have changed mm -hmm. recently. And people, they, I think in the, the region over the last, I would say 30, 40 years, there was a bit of vertical expansion on the cities, mm -hmm. going high, high, high rise and skyscrapers. And then this is also shift because of the shift of people's mentality and the people's kind of, you know, uh, lifestyle pattern that have changed. So that's why going back to the concept of communities, there's more tendency now towards horizontal expansion. Even if you're talking about giga scale projects, within these giga scale projects, you're still talking about communities and hubs and neighborhoods, which by default is gonna enhance the mobility. I mean, we understand that we're living in a harsh climate during summertime, either it's very dry or it's very humid. So there's certain things we cannot change. But it's not about changing the weather, it's just enhancing the the people's experience within the mobility between the cities and between the neighborhoods and the communities. So I think the more kind of, you know, the designs recently are shifting towards, you know, creating um, a life experience, a community experience for people. Um, this by default is going to enhance lots of um, aspects, whether it's about people's mobility, the sustainability, the weather conditions, etc. So again, the, the, the vertical expansion that we've used to, to notice, it's, it's completely now shifting and we started to, to explore more the horizontal expansion, which is by default gets engaged by public realm, landscape, greenery, water features, whatever they're needed. So it becomes more of it going back to the, to the human scale kind of experience. Yeah, I think the human scale is very important if you want people to respond positively to your, your designs. Yeah. Amar, do you want the last word on this? Yeah, just, I mean, I, Continuing on what Dalia said, you know, I think we're fortunate in Saudi Arabia that, as you said correctly, people are willing to adapt and change. And, and I say we're also fortunate that it's a young population. You know, I know, for example, from 
you know, all of us, probably our generation, when we were growing up, everybody wanted to drive and get into a car. My kids don't even have that aspiration at all. They all want to get in an Uber, they want to get on a, on a public transport system. They have no interest in, in, in driving. So, you know, the, the way society is changing, the way cultures are changing, the way, uh, you know, people's needs are changing, people want to be stuck to their phones, they don't want to be driving and, 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 and focusing on the road. So if you pro I, I really strongly believe if you provide the right you know, transportation systems and the right TOD uh, environments, uh, you know, people will naturally gravitate towards it. Um, nobody wants to be stuck in one and a half years of their lives uh, in a car. Um, you know, it's stressful, it's, um, it's uncomfortable, it's a, it's a waste of, of, of time. Uh, so you know, you know, master plans, uh, city developments, uh, providing the right network and infrastructure will definitely, be, I think, see people gravitating towards these kind of uh, uh, communities. Okay, good, good response, thank you. I think moving on to the next subject, headed rules and norms that mandate innovation. Um, one of my personal viewpoints is that sometimes developments are certified green, although the energy supplying the developments maybe isn't so green. How do you, Karim, I think if you want to respond to that? Do you think that's a valid point of view or should yeah, we take what we can? It's a, it's a tough one. I mean, the, the, there are a lot, obviously, the, the idea that if you, if you have a more n narrowly focused band of, uh, of, of examination and, and, and um, endeavor in terms of green accreditation, your, the potential to achieve success is higher. But that, that, that narrowing also means that you lose that cross-sectoral uh, value that you get across multiple industries and multiple sectors and the value that generates in terms of uh, innovation and creativity. So I think, you know, I still believe that perhaps a more stratified system needs to come in so that you have more focused uh, accreditation for different typologies uh, and across different sectors rather than a, a one-size-fits-all approach to getting a gold or a bronze or a silver or a platinum. Um, you know, sometimes the, the difference between a gold and a platinum is so fine that, you know, what makes you decide for a gold or, or, or a platinum? So I think having a more focused approach, a more, uh, more responsive approach to what you're trying to achieve across platforms will also generate more interactivity and more innovation. I think I would ask Neil, when you're master planning, do you have any demands on the, the wider infrastructure? So I say that I, I can't hear you quite well. Uh, sorry, when you're, when you're master planning, do you have any demands on the infrastructure for green energy? Or do you make, uh, you know, within five, ten years, all the energy supplied to the development will be from renewable, renewable sources? Is that something that's part of your remit at the moment? I can, sorry, there's, I'm getting terrible feedback in here. I can't hear the question so well. Can you just repeat it once more time? You want to use this one? The feedback's to, I can't hear anything. Is that better? Hello? Yeah, it's better. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, it was just in response to master planning. Yeah. Um, do you have requirements on the, the wider infrastructure for energy supply? So, so you're designing a, a Mazda green city. Do you demand that the energy has to be from a renewable source, or were you happy to...? Yeah, I think often it kind of comes down to the client. I think within Woodbagger, we have an integrated sustainability team, and we try and integrate it from the outset in terms of our overall thinking, and often with the, the engineering partners. We kind of create a series of scenarios and kind of play that back to the client, and every client has got different expectations of what kind of levels of sustainability they're looking for. So we, we always maximize or try to achieve the highest we can achieve, but it has to align typically with the clients who we're working with, uh, to kind of so it fits their budget or fits their aspirations. But we try and educate or kind of you know, talk about these topics of sustainability within infrastructure, within the planning of how we can integrate that. So it's kind of more of a, a discussion and we tailor that more towards kind of what the client is expecting or what they're kind of happy to uh, facilitate. 
I mean, there's a, there's a major push in country to have renewable energy, so we, we know it's coming. It might not be quite available now, but it, it is on its way. Yeah, and it's interesting. I think we work with kind of lots of different clients, and I think, you know, if you look at kind of what the Red Sea and Amala are doing, they're kind of setting the standards, really, with sustainability. I think their target is 100% renewable energy with solar power. I think they are going to have the world's largest battery store, so they can kind of power overnight. And I think there's kind of certain clients who are willing to set the standard. I think the challenge where it comes is when you begin to design for a, a lower or middle market. I think the cost of this infrastructure of sustainability can be quite high. Uh, when you design it for a lower or middle market, that cost typically has to filter down, and then price points change depending on what type of development you're looking at. So it becomes quite a challenge, and, it, and it, it, I guess it's quite a complex um, decision of how you come to that kind of the implementation of sustainability and kind of, kind of what type of market it suits as well. But doesn't that come back to the point you were making earlier on? I mean, in the sense that we can't look at these things in isolation. We were talking about how we go back to more traditional methods of you know, how innovation affects sustainable design. So do we need to necessarily always look for the, the high technology response rather than you know, the more traditional uh, approaches that we were talking about that have already been uh, proven over, over millennia? And I think yeah. the debate around sustainability innovation, it becomes so stratified you know, it, you start going down individual route roads that I need to achieve this, but then I forget this. Yeah. Whereas I think as good designers, and I think we all advocate that here on, on this panel, is that you look at a suite of different approaches when you're, when you're looking at sustainability and how innovation can support that and drive yeah. that out in, a, in the most efficient way possible. I, I think the, the, the problem, sorry, the, the problem is we get sometimes bogged down by the accreditation systems, you know, so we're focused on getting a lead uh, platinum, but you know, uh, is it important for this particular uh, you know project or this particular uh, you know type of ty typology of building? Um, I think uh, accreditation systems have to be localized. They have to meet the requirements of that particular uh, country, that particular culture, that particular uh, code, uh, so that it actually makes sense in, in the context that it's that it's in. I think there's, I mean, pretty much all the projects. The clients, they set up their kind of guidelines, a very strict, respective kind of, you know, mandate or blueprint mm -hmm. about the, you know, their approach, which is absolutely fine as long as it's not been taken off the shelf. You know, sometimes there's, you know, a certain mandate that they just insert in the RFP because it, it has to be there. Mm -hmm. And we've started to notice that actually these are actually starting to change and be more tailored towards the actual project and the region and the, and the background of the project more than just being something you need to, uh, a box you need to take. Dahlia, question for you. Um, do you think designers can inspire society to uh, embody net zero and understand that it, you know, it's for the greater good with climate change and all the concerns? Do you think that's a possibility? Do you think it's being achieved? There's no sound. I think. Hello? Can you hear that? No? <laughs> Coming with another mic for you. <laughs> Sorry for the technical difficulties. Hi, Dali. Hey, <laughs> he's back. Uh, do you think designers have the ability to inspire society to oh, understand what it, net zero means? Hold it very close. Oh, very, very close. Good. Right, that's that. <laughs> Yes, Do you think, yeah. yes, definitely um, designers can always have an impact um, in what they do and they have re the responsibility to educate community and to educate their clients um, as well. And for example, for interior designers, um, there are a lot of, of things that we work with that supports sustainability and connects with, with other um, disciplines, um, connecting interior with exterior, um, working with biophilic design, um, having low water flow fixtures, for example, and they're working with uh, LED lighting, etc. So there is a lot of these small things that we can push for. Um, I remember one of the clients I used to work with, um, I said, well, you have to use low um, 
water texture for water consumption and they were like no we want the most expensive thing so I just brought the, the fixture itself and I said well what do you feel and then they said it's good I said well this is air and water you just don't feel it but you're serving the community um, so s these sort of education to others because not everyone is aware of the, this impact that you can get to the community um, but also I, I, I will come back to the vision because this I think is something that is aspiring for us and, and for Saudi one of the things in the vision is having Mostadam Mostadam gives a bit of, of flexibility but again all of the Giga projects, I believe, are working with, with at least Mostadam. So sustainability is working ac across all, um, which I believe is interesting. And I really like that the conversation of what we used to do in the past and how can we use it. Because in Dara'iya, for example, we are building now with, with the old building techniques using the mud render, which is supporting local content and having this is, is just amazing we are building with courtyards courtyard system which which wasn't used recently people as you said went high rise but now we want to go back to g plus two maximum so we have this low rise and other parts of saudi they are going back to mashrabia yeah. where it suited their their needs and their environment so i think if we go as designers and rethink of how we are re designing our products, we will have a bigger impact on the community. Thank you. Amr, do you, do you feel as a designer you can educate people and make an impact? Do you feel you're making a difference at the moment? I mean, as, as architects and designers and engineers, I think it's a, it's, it's a must that we do this because nobody else will do it. You know, historically, it's always been the architects or, or the designers who led this process and then sort of, you know, moved things in a certain direction from a design perspective. Uh, uh, so definitely, we, we, not for lack of trying, we do do it, but there are many more complexities these days, you know, whether it's cost, whether it's regulation, whether it's, you know, reacting to the, to the requirements of the client and, and, and the contractors and the, the developers. Uh, so it's a much more complicated process. I believe, I don't know if you, you know, agree with me, the architects used to be at the top of the food chain, um, but the food chain has changed over the last 20 years. You know, there are many more uh, parties involved, whether it's project managers, contractors, clients, developers, and so on. Um, we just need to keep persevering and, 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 and to continue trying to stay sort of uh, at that uh, top level where we are uh, creating and, and, and inspiring the right design process. Cool. Kerem, you want to continue? You think we are making a difference? <laughs> well, look, I mean, I, I think designers have always been mediators. Um, we're often posed with challenges that we don't create, um, set by one party, not necessarily desired by another. Uh, and I think all of us here have been, uh, as designers, in that position where we have to sort of take the technologies that we are presented with uh, and either you know, persuade stakeholders of the, the veracity of those uh, requirements. And you know, net zero is something that is a big aspiration. And I think it's an aspiration that we you know, fundamentally need to try to achieve. Um, whether or not we get there fully on every project is questionable. And I think we need to be realistic about that. I don't think we can necessarily achieve it on everything that we're going to do. I, I appreciate the uh, endeavors that uh, Red Sea are saying. I'm not sure they'll ever get there 100%. And I think we have to have conversations that are realistic. You know, what is, what is net zero carbon? Is it truly achievable across the board? I, I, that's a debate that we don't have, honestly. We, we say to ourselves, we're going to do it. And then when we don't achieve it, we sort of let it slide by. So as designers, our role is to actually have a conversation like this that says, well, what's the purpose of this and why are we trying to achieve it? And is it really uh, applicable to what we're going to be working on right now? Uh, g given that we're at this event discussing this subject in front of an audience, I think we are getting the message across. I think 
Tarek, do you think you're, you feel you're making a difference? You feel people are responding to net zero sustainability, the urgency of? I, I think just going back to the point of design and stroll towards societies and, and people, I don't think it's beyond, beyond the law. I think it's designers, they have more an obligation towards people and communities and cities. I mean, we are place makers. I mean, it's, it's, we, we sometimes underestimate the impact. People respond to what we give them in terms of designs, buildings, and communities. We, we have an impact on their social pattern, on their behaviors. So I think we have a huge responsibility towards how the designs are, uh, are shaping their, uh, their life experience, uh, whether it's from a, you know, the, the environmental experience we give them or the social experience we give them. So definitely there is a pivotal impact and responsibility that designers they do. I mean, we, sometimes we forget that we don't just provide a, a piece of a sofa for somebody to sit. We, we provide things that have a visual impact on people. They have a social impact on people. They have a, a performance. Uh, so it's it's a huge responsibility we carry on, and um, we should be accountable of how we how we do it and. Uh, and what, uh, what value or what impact we, we leave in the cities. So we have to mock, occupy the moral high ground and maintain our positions from there. Uh, good, good answers. Okay, um, moving on to our third topic. I think how relevant is this innovation in green engineering to the end user? How can designers help foster better development between communities and developers in a, in a partnership? Who wants to volunteer for that one? I, th I think it has certain parallels with the last conversation. I mean, you know, uh, the engagement of, you know, certainly in, in private development where you're working for a particular stakeholder means that your engagement with community is re relatively limited. I think, you know, the, the, the desire for us as designers to actually engage with the end user is always there because that's who we're designing for. As you say, as, uh, as Tarek says, we're, we're placemakers and we're creating places for people. It's very rare, certainly my experience in the last 10 years in, in this region is that I've actually had the opportunity to talk to the end user very often. Um, we don't have, we have stakeholder engagement, which is usually at, a, at an earlier level, but stakeholder engagement in terms of community engagement is much harder to achieve and perhaps it's happening more here in Saudi now. I think uh, the community seems to be quite engaged here, which is great. Having the opportunity to then interface with community dialogue is something that I would love to see more of and I think it's something that we all relish as designers and it is part of informing the design process that we get involved with. I think over to Neil, do you think developers understand the need for community within a development? Yeah, I think, I think it's definitely beginning to improve. I think uh, the importance of community, green open space for communities, I think kind of post-COVID has kind of had an effect as well. I think the kind of where people work, when they work, how they work has completely changed. So more and more people working from home and kind of working at being agile. I think the importance of more open green spaces within communities is definitely there. So there's always the, the dilemma of how much open space do you have to kind of provide uh, in terms of kind of the return of investment, I think. But I think we know that kind of open space, green open space kind of typically, I think if we think about happy cities and creating kind of successful communities, stress levels always reduce when people are in green space, endorphins increase. So I think developers are beginning to realize the importance of communities as a desirable place for people who want to live and to work and to play and to enjoy their lives. So I think it's, um, whilst there's a, the offset of kind of the open space and creating this infrastructure for community space, I think kind of the, the return on investment really is the kind of the desirability to live within these communities, what developers are making. And I think more and more that the, the kind of the standard is being raised every time. I think especially when you look at what's happening in Saudi Arabia at the moment. Uh, previously it wasn't always there, but I think with PIF and a lot of these new developments coming into play, kind of the sense of community is really sit to the heart of kind of what makes a successful development. And a community which is rooted in its culture and its context is, is really important as well. Do you find the developer leads are receptive 
uh, you know, sort of green initiatives? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I think uh, from my perspective, most developers are always looking for a USP. What makes their development different? What makes their community different? I think, uh, especially in Saudi Arabia, that it's kind of rooted in the culture and its context of kind of kind of creating places which people feel comfortable in, from privacy, from kind of social norms. Uh, so it, it's a really kind of plays a big factor in kind of creating that the heart and the identity of their development and a lot of it is rooted in community and lifestyle. Yeah, Dalia, uh, the Diria Gate project is obviously a, a world-class example of urban redevelopment and development. How do you feel it's responding to the, the demands of the society? Uh, I think Neil explained what we do exactly because our project is rooted in culture, history and it's basically built upon communities and the community would have residential hospitality, cultural um, parks and you know everything that you would like to do is, is there and it's something that we are lucky to be working in. Um, I always say I go every day to work and there is something new experiencing um, and I'm sure that this is going with other projects um, in the kingdom in general as we have a very clear vision and I think that's what helps because if you don't have a clear vision that everyone is working towards it's difficult to achieve and we're all determined to achieve that. Yeah. Amr, do you share the viewpoint? Yeah, I just want to uh, link this back to so community engagement with you know, artificial uh, intelligence because I think that's interesting. You know, it's early days now but future buildings and communities are going to be I believe much more sort of living or, you know, organisms with you know, monitoring tools that tell you how people are behaving, which areas are responding well to the design. Because we designers, okay, we, we, we respond to briefs, we respond to our certain experiences, but we don't, let's be honest, we don't always get it right. And, and things change and usability changes and people's behavior uh, changes. So with sort of you know, tools that monitor how a building is, is, is operating and, and its life cycle, it will create sort of, you know, if you're not able to engage with the community, then the building itself will talk back to you and generate information and data that allows you to repurpose that building or, or, or modify certain areas. Or, so, so I think just you know, technology is, is, is moving at such a fast pace that in five, ten years' time, the way we, we, we work and engage with our communities is going to change tremendously. Tarek, do you want the last word on yeah, this? I think it's, it's important when we talk about communities that we we go beyond the concept of, okay, when you talk about communities or projects, it's the communities within the specific plot or a specific. I think there's an important mandate and responsibility also to address the communities where the project is located. Because quite often, designers with the clients, we design for the end users. You know, whether it's a mixed use project, or even if it's a small master plan, the community in our mindset is the people who are actually going to be used that piece of project. But I think, we need to look at the further context and look about the, you know, the old urban fabric and the urban context around it because the design should be serving both, both entities and there should be a complete synergy between the, the direct community and the kind of the extended community within the project. And it's not because Dallas is thinking that that's what, the, for example, I, I love about the Raya project, that there's a super high level of attention towards communities. And that's why all the assets, they always refer back to each other because there is a, I mean, the connectivity is extremely important and pivotal and that's why on, on the scale of cities, not only communities, that's how you know, the successful uh, transition and expansion happens. Yeah, I think Diri has been successful in retaining a human scale to, to the arrival experience, the use of the project and the, the, the whole aesthetic of it. Okay, that, that's a really good, really interesting point. So I think the Kerem raised an issue about biophilic design and how we can, not just interior but exterior, how, how designers can improve people's well-being in the use of buildings and the use of uh, redevelopments and urban developments. How do you want to...? Did I raise that? Uh, okay. <laughs> yes, you did. I, uh, I thought it was Neil, but um, I'll feel it. I, obviously, yes, but... biophilic design is all the things that Neil was saying. Is It's all about human well-being. And not just in terms of the external environment, but also the environments that we inhabit internally. And so bringing, bringing contextual design, contextual biophilicity 
into our uh, daily lives is something that's, I think, really quite important. It's really enriching. It sort of allows that uh, moment of spiritual connection and also cultural connection to where we come from and the places that we're in. So I, I, I see it as valuable. I think often it's used as a bit of a sop um, and as a more of decoration. I think really engaging in that process in a very effective way. And I think a lot of that's ha actually having happening very successfully here in terms of the inside outside transitionary spaces that then allow interior spaces to be enriched um, is, is happening successfully. Okay, Dahlia, from your interior perspective, you, you agree with the, the, the greening of internal spaces? Are there other, are other approaches other than uh, putting greenery in uh, internal areas to, to make people respond and feel happy in the place? So, uh, again, I think biophilic design in general, the effect of it is substantial mm. because it affects the well-being, it affects the cognitive uh, approach, you know, and what we usually do is we engage with the architects to bring the outside in. That's very important. Depend on where setting you are. If you are in a beach city or more of a desert, or this is important to be part of the nature, which we belong to as humans. So basically, again, coming back to what we originally are um, and feel that. And then after that, it comes, can we do something with the interior, bringing in the uh, planting and in, inside, courtyards, um, something that would make you feel at ease when you want to relax. This is my relaxing spot. And I think that's the whole idea, is to feel home at the end, finding a place where you feel home. Good, point well made. Neil, from a, you know, trees make people feel happy, green spaces make people feel happy. How, how much of a, you know, in the sort of zero to 10, how important is that to uh, urban redevelopment or master plan? Yeah, yeah, I think it's critical, to be honest. I think um, kind of whatever type of development you create, and I think people, humans, have a innate desire to be outside, to connect with nature. I think if you look at, Riyadh's a great example, you know, kind of during the evenings, a lot of people like to be outside, Wadi Hanifa, kind of edge of the world, people kind of want to be outside, so I think it's uh, wherever you can provide those opportunities, whether it be commercial development, whether it be residential development, you know, places for families to play, um, and as I say, you know, kind of the day-to-day -day life of people is stressful, life is stressful, any opportunity where you can bring those stress, stress levels down, where you can make people happier, and it's scientifically proven that people in these environments are less stressed, they are kind of happier, so I think making sure that everybody has that proximity to open space, a green space, places to dwell, places to spend with the family. I think um, you know, from a, you're in the office and you've, you've got a place, a pocket park, which you go, you go and sit and dwell in. I think it's critical, really. I think it's something which, from a master plan perspective and the open, open space strategy is what we try to create. It's one of the key aspects what we thread through all of our design. Uh, ironically, more trees means more irrigation. Can that be sustainable? It doesn't necessarily have to be more trees. It can be kind of, you know, we can shade spaces kind of without using uh, kind of uh, natural elements. So I think there's different ways in which you can create open spaces rather than just big pieces of park. So I think there's kind of, uh, kind of lots of more contextual ways in which and how we can do that as well. Eric, do you feel you're involving organic material more with a your interior elements of the, the designs that you're involved with? Sorry, I couldn't hear that well. The acoustic is pretty... Do you feel you're using more you know, plants and organic material to, feel, to make people feel I mean, at home in the office I mean, space? By, by, by default, but I think, again, to the point that it's about not just adding greenery in the space, it's just about having a bit of, you know, removing the borders and boundaries mm. between exterior and interior. You still need physical boundaries, of course, but I'm talking about the visual boundaries to be removed mm. and, and within the people's experience to bring the inside, outside and vice versa. And this is going to enhance the people's, you know, experience in the space. You don't need to be sitting in the garden as long as you can see the, the, the green space. So kind of the concept of semi-pockets, courtyards, shaded courtyards, completely open. It gives just have a huge impact on the people's experience, mentally, socially, and um, and definitely elevates their uh, their experience with the building and the project. Okay, thanks. Um, I think we're out of time now. So, Amr, do you want to 
uh, one final word on this wrap up? No, I mean, just going back to this, you know, biophilic design and bringing nature in again and, and you know, continuing on Dahlia's, you know, project in, in, in Diraiya. If we look at history, again, I'm a bit biased, but the Hanging Gardens of Babylon are a great example of that where, you know, where nature is, is brought back in, into project. And that's thousands of years old. So it's just natural, uh, you know, human uh, behavior to be drawn to, 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 to greenery and, and nature. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone. Great contributions, much appreciated. Thank you. 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 Thank you.